The Civil War. Those words conjure up thoughts of battles and bloodshed. The blue and the gray, brother against brother, American against American. Battle staged mainly in the Old South, but what about Indian Territory? Native against Native, yes, brother against brother. Just a few miles northeast of what today we call Shakota, Oklahoma, the largest battle in Indian Territory, and what could be argued the largest battle west of the Mississippi, took place on July 17, 1863. One of the most intriguing facts about this battle is that white soldiers were decisively the minority in this battle. Native Americans and African Americans made up the majority of both fighting forces. At the battle's end, around 700 men lost their lives. It's their brave deeds and their blood that have hallowed that ground, and this week we remember them. We remember the Battle of Honey Springs. Yes, um, I'm with the, I'm the commander of the Texas 10th Artillery, Light Artillery. And what you're looking at is a representation of headquarters camp. We're attached with the 9th Cav. Our job is to try to keep them alive at longer ranges. What you're looking at here, what you saw there, is called a mountain gun or regimental gun. It's smaller than a howitzer. It's designed for anti-personnel. About a 300-yard range. The idea is to come up with a line of foot troops, bring this up over a rise, fire it, waste a, waste a company, and then come back down. And over here, it's called a cohorn mortar. Because no matter what size the gun is, you still need about six men to run it. But you can run diminished crews. The interesting thing about artillery is it was the most educated branch of the military service. Every soldier, every artillerist, whether he be the lowest private to the highest officer, had to be able to know arithmetic and writing and understand it. Because any position could be covered by another person. You know, with an infantryman, give him a rifle, tell him point in that direction. Artillery was basically science and math. But it was really important because, like with this gun, even though it's got a shorter range and a smaller piece, you still got to know how much powder to put in and how, how, and how effective the range is of where you're going. And, you know, because if you're, if you're just, throwing, you know, just throwing ammunition out there and doing nothing with it, you're not, you're not being effective. But the positions, like I said, there's six people running this gun. You have on this side the worm. And it's called the worm because of the particular corkscrew device implement they use. Over on this side, he's also the loader. You have the swab and the ram. His job is to swab down the barrel to keep it cool and take off any oxygen. And down here, you would have the prick and the prime. He's the one who pricks the charge and clears the tube and puts the primer on to get the, fire, the shot fired. Over here, you'd have the jerk. Because what he would have is a lanyard here to jerk it out and fire the round. Back here, where that limber box would be, you'd have the powder monkey and the gunner. The gunner's in charge of this piece. The commands would start from the limber. Where everyone would be on the limber, say, file from the limber, file on the piece. Then each member would go to their position. The two front guys are always going to be at the hub, and they're going to stay there. Their job is also to mark it, because this is not a recoilless cannon. It will recoil anywhere from six inches to a foot. And you leave them there where you can bring it back to where you have it in battery. And battery means it's loaded and ready to fire. The first command, once everyone's in their position, is to service the piece. You want to make sure the piece is safe to use. So what would happen is, I'm going to show you what the implement, the equipment. The prick in the prime would come here first. He's going to go to the touch hole, go in there, make sure it's clear. Then he's going to take his thumb stall. Come over here and yell at a loud voice, vent clear. Once the, he's called the vent being clear, then the worm is going to make sure there's no trash in the barrel. Because what the rounds were made at the time were either using silk or linen. And when it fired off, there were sometimes burning embers in there, trash. You had to get that trash out. So you'd use this particular corkscrew, bring it in. Dig it and you have a special position. You keep your thumbs out like this because if there's any blowback, you can still keep your hands. Once you got it cleared out, that would signal for the swab. And what the swab would do, depending on how wet his mop is, he'd dip it in the swap bucket, 
make sure it's completely wrung out. You don't want a lot of water because you'll flood the tube. You flood the tube, it's useless. Mm -hmm. Then you want to bring it in. And you want to hear that thump. Two things for that thump. One is it denies oxygen, so there's no burning embers. Another is the tubes of the time period were made out of solid brass or iron. After a lot of combat, there could be micro fractures in the tube. When you hear that thump, that means that the tube has still good integrity and not dangerous. Once he's done with that, he will pick up the ram and go in the ready position, which means implement on the boot, not in the dirt. Now at the same time, the worm is now going in the loader position called the begging position. He'd be like this, waiting. Once the gun is safe, cleared, the gunner would say to his powder monkey, depending on what the round they needed, in this case, one live round canister, low. The powder monkey would look on the limber box, look up where the canister round is, put it in his satchel, bring it to the gunner. The gunner would look at the satchel, inside the satchel, approve the round, said the round is good, send it down range. Then, powder monkey comes up to the loader. Loader takes the round out of the bag, turns his back to the enemy. The reason why is the enemy has sharpshooters out there trying to hit the round. If he hits the round when it's out here, the gun crew's gone. And we'd rather, we can afford to lose a loader, we can't afford to lose the whole gun crew. So the, he holds it like this, he brings it down, slides it in, puts it flat. Once he does that, then the ram rams it home, seats it really good. Then prick and prime will prick the charge. Once he's pricked the charge, he's going to put the primer on, whether it be a musket cap or a friction primer. Then he's going to hold it there. He's going to control this piece. Now, the jerk will then hook his lanyard on there. Then he'll nod to the jerk, saying now he has control of the piece. The jerk will go to his ready position. Lower, the jerk will then, or the jerk will then raise his hand, letting the gunner know that the gun is ready. The gunner will say, I have it. He'll put his hand down and the gunner will put his hand up to let the section leader know. And a section is anywhere, depending on if he were a Confederate battery, he had three sections, because they had six guns, two, two, three two-gun sections. If you're a Federal battery, he had four guns, two four-gun sections. He'd raise his hand to the section leader saying that the gun is ready. The section leader said, I got it. He put his hand down. Then the section leader puts his hand up to let him know that his section is ready for the battery commander. Battery commander says, I've got it. Now you're waiting on the orders from the battery commander, but this gun does not fire until the gunner gives permission to fire. What will happen is, say, the command is by the battery, that means everyone's firing at the same time, and then, I, then the section leader would echo that command. By the section, I'd say, by the piece. And then the command would be, fire. Battery commander says fire, section leader says fire, gunner says fire, boom. Then it goes up, boom, goes off and then you go into servicing again. A well-drilled crew could fire this, fire any piece effectively like around a minute. That is fast. Now you normally wouldn't fire that fast unless you were really in hot combat because first off you don't want to burn up all your ammunition that quickly and second off you also had to worry about that it, you know the tube getting super hot and all of a sudden you put it a, put a, a silk or linen round on even no matter if you cooled it off it's still going to be hot burning through there and then life gets ugly mm -hmm. but if you're in a hot situation where you're being you know the chances of being overrun are great a good crew could get could put out enough fire to wipe out you know let's put it this way at uh, one of the battles under Stonewall Jackson Virginia his artillery commander, who had four guns, held off a division of infantry. A division is about a thousand men. He completely had them totally frozen in place. They didn't know what was attacking. Four guns, six men apiece.